In this section, we will be talking about friction. We will start by talking about the concepts around friction, then we will talk specifically about what we call static friction, and then kinetic friction, and then we'll be talking about how wheels work. But let's start with the basics of friction, the friction concepts. How does friction arise? Well, if you have a block on a surface, and you look on a microscopic level, you would notice that even smooth surfaces are actually rough. And so they tend to catch and cling. So how well two objects cling together, the surfaces, kind of depends on the roughness of those surfaces. If we want to represent the friction force acting on a body, we have to recognize that the friction force will always act opposite the motion or intended motion of the body relative to the other surface. So here we have the weight, the normal force, the pulling force, and the opposing friction force on this block. Does the, abo does the above block apply a friction force on the floor? If so, in what direction? It does. That's, the, that's Newton's third law. For every force, there is an equal and opposite force acting on the other body. And it's to the right. Another way of, in, of looking at this is you can say that the floor appears to be moving to the left relative to the block. So the block will exert a friction force to the right on the floor. Now let's talk specifically about trying to make an object move, but it not being able to move because of static friction. The friction that prevents the sliding of two surfaces relative to one another is known as static friction, F sub S. So here we have a block, it has a weight, and there's a normal force acting on it. And then there's a tension force exerted on the block by a rope. And the block does not move, which means there must be an opposing force that happens to be equal to that tension force. That is the static friction force. According to Newton's first law, we know that that must be equal to the tension force. Otherwise, the block would be accelerating. There is a maximum static friction that can be applied between two surfaces. That is known as the maximum static friction. Or sometimes it's called the starting friction because you must pull horizontally with at least that much force to make the block start moving. So I denote that as Fs maximum. The maximum static friction force that could possibly be exerted on this block by the surface is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. This is a way we can calculate what that maximum static friction force is. It doesn't mean that that's the force that's always acting on the block. That's just the force you must exceed for the block to start to slide. The maximum static friction force depends on the magnitude of the normal force between the surfaces, as well as how the material surfaces bind together as measured by the dimensionless quantity known as the coefficient of static friction. That is the Greek symbol mu, representing the coefficient of static friction. And it kind of makes sense that the normal force is here. The more, t more uh, force applied between the surfaces, the harder the forces, the surfaces are held together and the more the ridges embed themselves in uh, each other's surfaces. But this coefficient actually depends on the materials between, uh, that are being used. Let's look at an example. You want to move a 500 Newton crate across a level floor. To start the crate moving, you have to pull with a 230 Newton force horizontally. What is the coefficient of static friction between the block and the surface? Well, to do this, let's, find, let's draw a free body diagram. 
There's the weight of the block, there's a normal force, there's a pulling force, and then there's the opposing friction force. Specifically, it's not just static friction that is opposing the motion, but maximum static friction because this is the force you applied to get the crate to just start moving. So we are looking at the threshold when the block is just about, about to start moving. We don't have any acceleration yet because it's just about to start moving. We will draw a coordinate system that is most aligned with our forces. That's a standard coordinate system. And now we can apply Newton's laws. In the y direction, we can see that the normal force must be equal to the weight because there's no vertical acceleration. In the x direction, we don't have horizontal acceleration yet, but we do have forces. We have a positive tension force because it's pointing in the positive x direction and a negative Fs max. Fs max, we've shown, we've said earlier, is equal to mu sub s times the normal force. And we've already concluded that the normal force is equal to the weight. We can then see that the coefficient of static friction is equal to the tension force divided by the weight. So 230 newtons divided by 500 newtons. Newtons cancels out, and we see that the coefficient of static friction is equal to 0.46. So this is a way you can measure the coefficient of static friction between surfaces. Pull until the object is just about to slide, and that force divided by the weight is equal to the coefficient of friction between the surfaces. Let's look at another example. A sports car is rounding a flat, unbanked curve with radius r. If the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is mu sub s, what is the maximum speed, v max, at which the driver can take the curve without sliding? So here we are going to combine the concepts of friction and circular dynamics. First step, draw a picture, specifically a free body diagram. What's acting on this car? We have the normal force. Well, first we should start with the weight, and then the normal force is opposing that. There is also friction between the tires and the road. Which way is that friction force pointing? it's pointing inward because the car is accelerating inward. If the friction were not pointing inward, the car would slide along a straight path and essentially move outward relative to the circular path. So this would be the free body diagram of that car. Weight, normal force, friction. And since we're undergoing circular motion, there's an inward acceleration, a radial. Then we draw a coordinate system with the positive x direction in the direction of the acceleration so that the acceleration can be considered positive and so that we don't have to resolve the acceleration into components. Next, apply the laws. In the y direction, we can see that the normal force is equal to the weight because there is no vertical acceleration. The, in the x direction, we have one force which is responsible for the radial acceleration. You can characterize this as the centripetal force. That is what's causing the circular motion, but it is a friction force. So we have the sum of the forces in the x is equal to mass times the acceleration in the x, which is v squared over r, and that inward force is the static friction force. Now, in this problem in particular, they're asking them for the maximum speed you can drive at without slipping. So that's the case where you're driving faster and faster and faster until the friction force reaches its maximum. So you're just about to start skidding. So we can replace V with V max and Fs with Fs max. That maximum static friction force is mu sub s times a normal force. And we've concluded earlier that the normal force is equal to the weight of the car, mg. Then we can see that these masses will drop out so the mass of the car is irrelevant when it comes to determining the maximum speed you can drive at along this circular path. The maximum speed you can drive at is equal to the square root of mu sub s times g times r. Mu sub s is a coefficient of friction between the tires and the road, g is the free fall acceleration on the planet, and r is the radius of the circular path. Dimensionally this works, and it kind of makes sense with our intuition. With a smaller radius, it is harder to stay on the road. You have to drive slower or you will start skidding. And you can make the same arguments based on mu sub s and g.
Okay, now that we've talked about friction when uh, an object is not sliding relative to the surface, and even in the case of the wheels, the wheels themselves here are not sliding relative to the surface. They are driving, but they're not sliding. What if an object is sliding relative, an object surface is sliding relative to another surface? That would be a case where we would be dealing with what we call kinetic friction. The friction that acts on surfaces while they slide relative to one another is known as kinetic friction, or sometimes sliding friction. We will call it, call it kinetic friction. And the symbol we use is the variable f sub k. In this case, we have a block that is sliding on a surface. It's being pulled with a large force, and there is a kinetic friction force opposing the motion. The equation for the kinetic friction force is the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu sub k, times the normal force acting on the block. This force always acts in a direction opposite the motion of the body surface relative to the other body surface. The surface of the block is moving to the right relative to the floor, so the friction force acting on that block will be to the left. Let's see an example. We go back to this crate. Now you've pulled so hard that the crate is, has started to move. To keep it moving at constant velocity, you only need to apply 200 newtons horizontally. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the surface? First step, draw a picture, specifically a free body diagram. Here we have a tension force. We also have the weight and the normal force, and then we have the kinetic friction force opposing the motion or opposing the sliding. Then we can apply Newton's laws. There is no acceleration vertically, so the normal force is equal to the weight, and I've indicated that the upward direction is y and the rightward direction is positive x. And in the x direction, we still don't have any acceleration. There is motion, but no acceleration, because in the problem it says the, the block is moving with constant velocity. So. The sum of the forces must be zero, so tension minus the kinetic friction force must be zero. We can replace the kinetic friction with mu sub k times n, and the normal force is the weight. So we can find that the, mu, the coefficient of kinetic friction is 200 newtons over 500 newtons, or exactly 0.4, no units. So this is a way you can calculate the kinetic friction coefficient between two surfaces. Pull just as hard as you need to get the object to move with constant velocity. Measure that pulling force, divide by the weight, and you can calculate that coefficient. Note that the coefficient is dimensionless. So let's take a look at how friction changes when you're pulling on a block. Initially, if you're not pulling on a block, there is no friction force because there's nothing to oppose. As you pull harder and harder, the static friction force will increase to match that tension force. That's due to Newton's first law. If there's no horizontal acceleration, these forces must match. Until eventually you pull so hard that the friction force rises to the maximum and the block just starts to slide. At that point, the box will be moving and in fact the kinetic friction force will usually be less than the maximum static friction force. It's easier for the block to stay in motion than to get it to start moving. At that point, even if you pull harder and harder and harder, the kinetic friction force will be approximately constant. So we can see that it's usually more difficult to start an object sliding than it is to keep it sliding. You've probably found the same thing with physics homework. It's really hard to start, but once you start, it's a blast. You just keep going and lose track of time. It's great. Okay. So where are what are these coefficients of friction between two surfaces? Well, we uh, I can give it to you at times for problems, but you can also look it up in a table. Here's an example of a table that gives the coefficient of static and coefficient of kinetic friction between surfaces for different types of surfaces. And we can see that rubber on concrete has a very large, uh, has a relatively large coefficient of friction as we would want. We don't want our wheels to slide when we're driving a car.
Okay. Let's try a conceptual problem. A box of weight 100 newtons is at rest on a floor where the coefficient of static friction is 0.4. A rope is attached to that box and pulled horizontally with tension of, 20, of 30 newtons. Which way does the box move? Let's look at that crate one more time. Suppose you move the 500 Newton crate discussed earlier by pulling on the rope at 30 degrees above the horizontal. How hard must you pull to keep it moving with constant velocity? Remember the coefficient of kinetic friction we found was 0.4. Well first step we should draw a picture. Specifically we should draw a free body diagram. So here would be the free body diagram of this box. We have the weight of the box, the normal force acting on the box, we have a tension force at an angle, and then we have a friction force opposing the motion and parallel to the surface. That's done. Next step, identify the acceleration. The acceleration is zero because the velocity is constant. After that, we should draw a coordinate system. And since we don't have any acceleration, I'm gonna choose a coordinate system that aligns with most of the forces, as this standard coordinate system does. And then we can see that the only force we need to resolve into components is the tension force. We have T cosine 30 degrees and T sine 30 degrees. So now we have two vertical, two upward forces, one downward force, one rightward force, and one leftward force. Here these two forces are drawn on top of each other. If you feel like you're going to miss one of them, draw it to the side a little bit. Whatever will help you make sure that you use this picture and not miss forces. So now we can apply Newton's laws. In the y direction, we have the, sorry, in the x direction, we have t cosine 30 minus f sub k. And the cosine of 30 degrees is root three over two, and I went ahead and plugged that in. You can keep it as cosine of 30 if you'd like. In fact, I think it would probably be a better idea to keep this in there. This way you can change the angle at the end if you decide to use a different angle. However, to save space, I went ahead and plugged in the value of cosine of 30. F sub k is mu k times n, and then we can solve for the normal force acting on this block. It's equal to root three over two mu k, all times the tension force. In the y direction, we have three forces. We have the normal force plus t sine 30, or one half t, and in the negative y direction, we have the weight. So we can replace the normal force with what we found earlier. We can factor out the tension, or tension over two, and solve for the tension by adding w over and dividing by this coefficient. And we get this nasty expression for tension, which we can evaluate based on the numbers for the weight and mu sub k, and we get that the tension force is 188 newtons. Interestingly, we found earlier that you have to pull with 200 newtons horizontally to keep the crate moving at constant velocity. However, now you only have to pull with 188 newtons to keep it with Constant, moving with constant velocity when you're pulling at 30 degrees. Why is that? Why is it easier to keep the crate moving when you're pulling at an angle compared to pulling horizontally? It's because you are reducing some of the normal force by helping to lift the block. Let's consider another conceptual problem. Your little sister wants you to give her a ride on her sled. On level ground, what is the easiest way to accomplish this? The last thing I want to talk about is wheels and friction. If you push a car on a rough surface, the wheels will rotate. Why is that? Well, if you push the car 
or the wheel in itself, the bottom of the wheel will be in contact with the floor and there will be a friction force opposing your attempt to slide that bottom surface to the right. And as a result of that force to the left, opposing the bottom sliding to the right, the wheel will start to rotate clockwise. Is this friction down here static or kinetic friction? It's static friction because the bottom of the wheel, the rubber, is not sliding relative to the floor. It is rolling, so there is contact, and then the contact is released, but there isn't any sort of sliding occurring. If, on the other hand, you rotate the wheel itself, which is what actually happens when you're in your car and pressing on the accelerator, if you were to rotate the wheel itself by rotating this axle, your car will move forward. The reason is that your, your wheel, the bottom of your wheel, is trying to move to the left relative to the floor. As a result, the floor will exert a friction force to the right, opposing the intended motion of this bottom surface. And that friction force to the right will cause your car to accelerate to the right. Is this static or kinetic friction? It's static friction, again, because the wheel is not sliding relative to the surface. Now you might ask yourself, why do we use anti-lock brakes? You have enough information at this point to figure out why anti-lock brakes are a good system to use. You can take some time to think about that.